So the treasure that I'm talking about is actually found in 2 Corinthians. The PowerPoint's going to be wrong. It's listed 1 Corinthians. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 reads like this. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Now that's all you have got. Oh, you have it all. So it goes on to say this. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. This treasure that we're talking about, as far as serving is concerned, is this treasure in us. If you know who Jesus Christ is, the fact that He's the Son of God, and, and He came, and He, he lived among us, and He died on a cross, and if you agree and acknowledge the fact that He died on a cross and was raised again, if you confess Him with your mouth that all of that is truly who He is, He's in you, and that's the treasure that we're talking about. And when he's in you, there's this all-surpassing power that is alive and active in you, and we've got to be responsible with it. That's the treasure that I'm talking about. And so if you're here this morning and you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have a treasure in you. Now, I, I went to Google Images, and I often do this to try to get a picture that would help connect the point. The only thing that came up was pirate treasure, and that doesn't really resonate. I don't envision a pot of gold or a chest of gold in, inside of me. It doesn't really resonate. And In fact, I, I tried to be creative with it, and there was, there was nothing that I could find that could depict this all-surpassing power. The only thing that we can do is speak to it. And the only thing that we can do is really see evidence of it in our lives. You guys know that the only reason that, that I'm even up here and the only reason why I might look and might come across kind, now if I I've, if I've blew you off sometime, then it wasn't my heart to do that, but if, if there's any kindness in me, if there's any love that comes out of me, if there's any grace and mercy, if there's truth and and um, compassion. Do you know the only reason any of that comes out of me is because of the treasure that's in me? There's, there's no other reason for it. There's no other root for it. And so I know me without Jesus, and it's a really foul me that none of you would want to know. I, I know that because I played the part where I grew up in the church, but I didn't necessarily walk in relationship with Christ. I perfected profanity outside of church. In church, I could look like the good church boy. And I was pleasant and kind and all that kind of stuff. I had a good act going, but I really loved football conversation, and, and I, could, I could hang with as crude a conversation as any of them. And so I know that when Jesus, when I allowed him to take root in my life, the good that came out of me is attributed to him. And we have to be responsible with the life that's in us. If we simply acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and then go throughout our life nonchalantly or without purpose, we're, we're missing something very, very big. And so this morning, we're not going to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're actually going to turn over a few books of the Bible to Philippians chapter 2. It's a great book. Um, if you have a lot of spare time on your hands, memorize it, Okay. It's a great book. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to dive into this and look at this treasure that's in us. And how, I like how Paul writes because he writes almost rhythmically where there's a, a flow to how he writes to us. And in chapter 2, let me, let me just read it and then we'll go back to it. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And now there's this crazy mural that he paints for us of, of who this Jesus is and, and this attitude that Jesus took on. And he's saying this should be your attitude. 
who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. In other words, he's saying he was in his divine nature, but that didn't keep him from coming down and becoming us. Do you, like That alone is, is so crazy to wrap our heads around, the fact that he looked at us and said, you are worth me surrendering everything that I am, my nature, my holiness, my divinity, all of that. You are worth me laying all of that aside and me becoming you and being with you. That's crazy. But he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we'll get through the rest of the verses at the end because they kind of spell out the why he's saying what he's saying here. So we're going to go back through this and look at it verse by verse as, as good as we can. Verse, verse 1, he says this th- uh, four times. He says, if any, if any, surely out of four categories, if any of these things relate to you, we are all in the same boat. He says, first of all, if any of you, if you have received any encouragement from being united with Christ, there's the first one. How many of you have received encouragement from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? Anybody? Okay, great. Love the show of hands. Because we all face stuff. There's a lot of minutia that happens in life, right? A lot of things that we set in motion ourselves. There's a lot of stuff that happens around us that we didn't choose for ourselves. And we can become discouraged by the stuff around us. Whether we bring ourselves into it, we think something was going to be a certain way and it ended up not being that way. And we're like, gosh, how, how did I end up here? Or there's things that happen around us that we didn't choose for ourselves, and it's like, what is going on with the world? I, I, I think I've had that conversation more often than ever before with, with a whole array of demographics. What is happening to our world? And I become, I, I don't even like looking at Facebook anymore because I become discouraged. Either someone else's life always looks better than mine, or something is always going wrong. How many of you do that? You look at someone's, like, I, someone else's life, they're always doing like selfie pics, like, like their, their selfie pictures are always smiling. Do you know that back in the day, like the black and white photos, nobody smiled? You look it up. There was nobody that ever smiled. Family portraits, very stoic, and it, it has been revolutionized since cell phones and since selfie sticks. But we do, I do this. I look at people's lives. I'm like, oh my gosh, they're going here and they're going there and their life looks great. What is my life amounting to? And then I read news like 250 Christians being kidnapped by ISIS. I read stuff like that. That happened recently. And, and I get weighed down. And I need the encouragement of my God for my life. I don't, my, my brother-in-law is an undercover police officer, and, and, um, and since talking with him, I have such an appreciation for any law enforcement, any public service um, organization, because they see a side of the world that we don't see. And I think of the weight that they carry and what they process on a daily basis and the, the, the stuff that they see, and I'm like, how do they do it? We need encouragement. We need to know that there's hope. And so if any of us have ever received any encouragement from Jesus, let's place you right here. Now we go on. If any comfort from his love, I know that I've been comforted from his love. In in fact, the most profound times in God's presence has been when I've heard him say whether whether quietly or through another person when they're praying over me. Have any of you had this experience where somebody's praying over you and they're saying, they say your name, so they're praying, 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 and then they just stop and they say, Josh, 
God simply wants you to know that he loves you. And it's like a flood washes over your life and, and you're like, holy cow, I completely, for whatever reason, lost sight of the fact that I have a God who loves me, who's not disappointed in me. So if you have had any comfort in his love, let's place you there as well. If any fellowship with the Spirit. Well, if Jesus is in us, I mean, we know we can have fun with this. If there's children in here, like we don't have a little man Jesus living in us, right? There's not like a mini man Jesus in us. It's his Spirit, right? Unless I'm wrong, I might have missed something in the Bible, but I'm pretty sure I'm not operated by a mini-man inside of me. It's His Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit in me. And I've had fellowship with Him. I keep knocking this thing over. I, I have fellowship with the Spirit. Where I lean into Him for, for understanding. I lean into Him to, to teach me as I read the Bible. And so if that's you, put you here as well. If any tenderness and compassion, in the King James Version, it actually doesn't say tenderness, it says bowels, like in here, like the, the innards on the inside. And, and the, only, the, the, the strongest way that I can relate to that is, is my relationship to my children. And that when they hurt, I hurt. There's, there's tenderness and compassion that I have for my children because they're a part of me. And if that's me as the dude, I can't even imagine Summer and, and all women who carry children for nine months and like the, the bond that they feel to a child. It's, it's crazy. Crazy powerful. Now, if we can step back for a moment and recognize that that is, is what God feels for us, His tenderness and compassion in the depths of who He is. If, if we have any association with that, he, Paul is also saying, then, then you're right here. Here's four different categories. Now, one of those four things should resonate with somebody in here or all of us together. With all of that in mind, he says this, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit and purpose. If we have all of those things going on, there's got to be unity with us. There's this, this shift in his statements where he goes to this barrage of oneness. Be unified. Be together. Work together, same mind, like-mindedness, unified. That, that, that should be the picture and those should be the adjectives and descriptions of the body of Christ. And it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out why, because it's Jesus in us, in that same DNA, that same character that's in all of us. All of, those, all of that oneness should be so natural. Right? It should be easy. It should be easy to speak the truth in love. It should be easy not to be intimidated. You should be your most comfortable in your own skin in the body of Christ than anywhere else. But is that the case? Is that is that a true statement of, of this body? Do you feel most like you when you are in the church? It should be because that's where we are all of one mind, one spirit, one love. And not only that, but one purpose. One purpose. Out of curiosity, I, I was um, wanting to know what, what the internet would say about one purpose, so I simply Googled one purpose, and I didn't know what I would find. I thought I would find like an off-band name except, instead of one direction. It was one purpose. I, I didn't know. Um, so the, first, the very first link to click on was 
a school by the name, it's One Purpose Elementary School, and they're starting this fall, 2015, in San Francisco. And it's a school uh, situated in impoverished areas, and their goal is to teach children to read. And, and you go through and you read the, the, staff, uh, the staff rundown. All of these different people from different backgrounds have these catered stories that fit the goal and the mission of this elementary school. It's really remarkable. I mean, these, these teachers have been around the world, but they're all coming together in San Francisco to do this elementary school to teach children to read because they feel that if children can read, then they can live successfully. Now, they had nothing to do with Jesus, but what was fascinating to me is that you have this staff of at least 10 to 13 people coming together like-minded, like mission, like purpose, and they're going for it. It was pretty amazing. Now, the next one was a, uh, it was a worship school, and so that was Christ's focus. It was called One Purpose Worship something or other. And then the third one was One Purpose Disaster Relief. And so it, it's amazing to see how that is used in these different organizations. The church should be their model. It should be. We have one Jesus. And the story is the same with all of us. Without him, we were destined to hell. Without him, we were destined to a life of no purpose. Now with him, we have new life. We have forgiveness of sin. We have, we're, we're made pure and holy. And and we're immediately, it's supposed to be immediately, we are immediately renewed in our purpose, the purpose of our life. Now, there's some of us that drag our feet a little bit to, to jump in with that purpose, but, but Jesus has purpose for our life. And when we are in this body together, it's, it's one purpose, and we're going to get there in just a few minutes. Come together, be unified, be like-minded, same love, one spirit, one purpose. And he goes on in verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Vain conceit is basically empty glory. It's where you strive and, and yearn for something that's, that you're focused on and, and that's about you and you want to accomplish it. And once you accomplish it, it's like chafe in the wind. It, it, it go, it's nothing no more. Have any of you had any pursuits like that in your life where you're like, you pursue for something and you run and run and run to attain and you attain it and it's, it's, it's not what you thought it was going to be. It's vain conceit, empty glory. There's a few things in my life that I, um, I don't think there's anything wrong with having like a bucket list or goals or things that you want to do before you pass away. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, but the, the purpose and the intent behind it, are you looking for recognition or popularity or whatever? That's where it gets a little muddy. Because if you're looking for accolades from people, I'll tell you, it does not last more than a blink of an eye. It's almost like you get a one clap, good job, and then the, they're already on to something else, recognizing, acknowledging something else. And so you did all of that for a one clap, good job, and you're left feeling empty. I don't want that to characterize my life, where my pursuits are empty pursuits. So what are you pursuing? I don't mean that I don't want to land too hard on the, the moms in here, but sometimes the, the pursuit of a mom can be more about having a clean house than, than being with children. And I remember landing on that a while ago at one of the services, and I remember there was an interview with a mom who said, you know, my goal, I, I, my goals were wrong. I realized that later in life, as I look back over my life, I want to have clean carpets and so I had clean carpets, but what I realized is 
there, there's, there's no stories with a clean carpet. And so her goals were wrong. I remember hearing a grandfather talk about that, about how so particular he was about having a clean car. Windows clean, interior clean, all this kind of stuff. And I remember hearing the story where he began to leave the handprints of sticky sucker fingers and popsicle fingers all over his window, and he began to leave it there because he didn't miss the grandchildren as much. Goals, your ambitions, are they right or are they, are they, do they need to be tweaked a little bit? Are they wrong or do they need to be tweaked a little bit? Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Even when we serve, we can serve with that, where we want to be recognized by our selflessness. Just don't serve, okay? Don't, don't serve if you have that mindset. We don't need to know what all you've done. Don't, don't just, just get your mind right first, then serve. Because it's not about our long list of what we've done while serving Jesus. You're going to get a clap and a thumbs up. It's going to end that quickly. His, and I don't mean to be cliche with this, but his applaud is worth so much more than what, what we receive from one another. Does that make sense? It's not bad to encourage one another and, and say, oh man, I saw you do that the other day and, and I, I didn't mean to be seen kind of thing. I don't, I don't want to be applauded for it. Let him applaud me. Don't, don't get all weird about it, but please don't let your motivation for serving to be, let's show how holy I am by how much I do. And he says this, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Not only look to your own interests, but to the interests of others. So it's not bad to look at your own interests. He doesn't say forget your interests. He says not only your own interests, but also the interests of others. Ask people what they're interested in. What do you do? What do you like to do? What do you find yourself doing? Why? How did you get there? How can I help you accomplish what you're wanting to do? How can I help you accomplish getting to where you're wanting to get to? So long as it's not just keeping carpet clean. Because remember, clean carpets don't have a story. Let me help you dirty your carpet so you have a story. Look not only to your own interests, but the interests of others. He says this, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ. Like, really, Paul, why would you have to say that? Is that not intimidating to anybody else in here? Like, the same mind as Christ? Who, being the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped but he made himself nothing. I say this almost every other week. The God through whom all things were created, by him, through him, to him, for him, that, that Jesus made himself nothing. And yet we can find ourselves striving to be something. But Jesus made himself nothing. This attitude thing is, is so important for us. Attitude is very, very important. In our frontline meeting today, we're going to talk about providing people with answers, but the answer isn't nearly as important as the attitude behind the answer that you give. Attitude is so important. You think about this, there's, there's some quotes from really smart guys throughout history that, that talk about attitude. Abraham Lincoln said this, We can complain because rose bushes have thorns or rejoice because thorn bushes have roses. That's attitude. It's perspective. Winston Churchill says, Attitude is a little thing that makes a big difference. So you can have the same answer with different attitudes and have completely different aftermath. Now I know... Um, 
our children are the only ones that get centered on, on a subject and they keep asking about it. Our, ours are the only ones that do that. Nobody has other, no other kids do that. But um, I remember, like, even recently, Aubrey, there's, like, snack time that she's very aware of, and she'll ask repetitiously, can I have a cheese stick or something, anything? And, and she, she knows where they are, so a cheese, cheese stick may not be the best answer but, or the best example, but um, she'll be asking for something. Where's this? Where's this snack? Where's this snack? Where's this snack? And I'm like, in the pantry! <laughs> or it could be, it's in the pantry. You see the difference? It's the same answer, different attitude. Attitude is so important. Your words might be right as a Christian, but when you, depending on your attitude, what comes out it may be so repulsive to somebody who doesn't know Jesus because the attitude stinks. Marcus Aurelius says, our life is what our thoughts make it. Leonardo da Vinci says, I love those who can smile in trouble. Attitude is so important. And then Paul gives us that, that snapshot of the, this, this attitude. I, I don't think we can fully understand what it means that is, in that Jesus was divine. Jesus was perfectly holy. He was completely righteous. And he chose to, to surrender that to become nothing. This is the list. This is the snapshot list of what Jesus became for us. He made himself nothing. He took the nature of a servant. He was made in human likeness. He humbled himself. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross, death by crucifixion. That's what's written about the one who was already perfect but made himself into human likeness. Doesn't register. But if the one who is almighty does that, then, then should not our automatic response to the life that God has given us to, is to be selfless? Our time. We can be so selfish about our time. We have a, not, not all of us, but some of us in here have a hard time being inconvenienced. When, wouldn't it be nice if people's needs came at a convenient time? It would be so much better. I would be even more eager to help them out. I was like, oh, I had nothing to do today but to help you and, and serve you and to help you out with what you're going through. It, it never works that way. There's always a practice to go to or a meal to cook or a house to clean or, or something that's got to be taken care of. It's never convenient. But what I read here about what Jesus did for us, nothing about any of this that we just read was convenient for him. In fact, I would say that it would be the ultimate inconvenience that he was willing to do. And as a result of him becoming nothing, this is what's said of it, or said of him. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, giving him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Every realm that exists, every realm that we see and don't see, every created being one day will bow before Jesus and confess and profess him to be Lord. And people have all kinds of different opinions about what they believe in. It doesn't matter what their opinion is. On that day, their knee will bow and their tongue will confess. What we don't understand is that Jesus, to whom everyone will bow before and confess, lives in us. And so why would we even think that our lives are, it's so frustrating to think about people that live nonchalant and, and purposeless lives, because that doesn't reflect the Jesus that's in us. 
He's full of purpose. He's full of intent. He's eager to serve. He's eager to give up everything for us. And this is why all of this is happening. This is why we should strive to live with one purpose. And this is why we should strive to allow Jesus to adjust our attitudes. In verses 12 through 16, it reads like this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. If you are sitting in here this morning and Jesus is your checklist or he's your comfort, like you've gotten comfortable with him, this right here tells us to pursue him with fear and trembling. So when's the last time that you were on your face because of, you, because of the recognition of the awesomeness of who God is? When was the last time in a, in a holy way were you in, in awe, in awestruck by the living God? Because right here is our encouragement to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you. See, it's God who works in you to will and to act according to what? According to His good purpose. So he goes on to say this, do everything without complaining or arguing. You get a hint of what the Philippians really wrestled with in these verses. Do everything without complaining and arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. Now, keep in mind, this was 2,000 years ago. This was not written last week. So if he's saying that it's crooked and depraved 2,000 years ago, that kind of lets you know what we're living in now. And this is the need for realizing the life of Christ that is in you and re- recognizing where you live and where you walk and where you work. It's not just happenstance. It's with purpose. And he says this, you live in this crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe as you hold out the word of life. And that word of life is basically as you, as you speak about the life of Christ, as, you, as, you, as your life reflects this word right here, as everything that you do by action, by word, by deed, how you walk, it communicates something. And so I want my life to communicate the word of God when I'm around people. And when that happens, the Bible is saying that we will essentially become a lighthouse to a very dark world. That is the big why to what we're reading this morning. The treasure that's in us, it's not so that we can say, I've got Jesus in my heart, and I'm special and you're not. It's so that Jesus can transform us from the inside out and we look, act, speak, and do different than the rest of the world. It's being a light. And one of my favorite things about mine and Summer's story is that very early on when, when she just couldn't get enough of me and I was like, fine, we'll go out on a hillside and just hang out. <clears throat> we went out on a blanket. In, I mean, this sounds like such a story, doesn't it? We went out, all we had was a blanket, and we lay out on the hillside of the Ignite, it wasn't Ignite then, but it was the Life East Bible College campus. And everything around us was pitch black. There were no lights or anything like that. And so you could see, you could see the skyscape like unreal. It was beautiful. And, and the thing that's fascinating, stars are only fascinating when it's dark, right? And so I've also been in caves, and that's not very pretty. In fact, it's quite creepy. I don't like going caving. You will never find me doing that as a hobby, because it's utter darkness. I don't mind the utter darkness of the sky because the stars are unbelievable. And the Bible is saying that when we let the life of Christ transform us to 
will and to act according to His purpose, His good purpose, that we ultimately shine like stars in the sky. Family fellowship, that's us. That's going to be us. My prayer is that every church in this area, that every congregant is a star in this community. And I'm not being cliche and saying you're like a rock star. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I want, them to, I want the life of Christ to be so evident. And people are like, man, the, the Christians seem to be having a lot more fun than, than us. What do they have that we don't? Why are they so peace-filled? Why do they have joy? You know, they're going through the same circumstances I'm going through, yet there's joy written all over their face. Why is that? And see, the world can tell us, I can make it through without Jesus. I can make it through these hard times without Him. You you know what? You're probably right. But we're going to come out on the other side with sanity and joy and peace and comfort and, and a relationship with God. Anybody else that I've seen go through stuff without Jesus, they get crazy. Have y'all ever seen somebody go through something without Jesus? I don't understand why they would choose to do that. It makes no sense. And so we let us live in such a way where people see our light. But it only comes when we have an understanding and we walk in a way where, where there's purpose for our life. If you've come in here this morning and you doubt, you doubt yourself, you doubt who God has wired you to be, can you, can you just allow God by the power of the Holy Spirit to punt those thoughts out of your head and out of your heart and out of your life? You have purpose, and I'll tell you why. Because God created you, and He does not make accidents. Every one of you has a purpose.